Hey, you guys want to buy some uh, some paintings? I got paintings for sale. I have a lot of them. They're cheap. Real cheap. Hey, welcome to the Fireside Tattoo Network. My name is Jake. So happy to have you back here with me for today's episode with my buddy Jason Leeser. So I was thinking recently, uh, I was at a convention and set up a few original paintings for sale and t-shirts and buttons and stuff like that. And I don't typically do that at conventions. I usually just show up and, and do my tattoos and, and you know, shake babies and kiss hands. But bringing those uh, original paintings along with me got me thinking about uh, fine art printing and, and, and really more specifically generating uh, different types of revenue when you're working at tattoo conventions. So a lot of times you're not booked in advance and it's nice since you've forked out so much cash to rent the booth and to get a hotel and flights and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's nice to have some potential for, for a secondary revenue besides tattooing. And I notice whenever I'm walking the aisles of tattoo conventions that there are a wide variety of quality of, of prints, whether that be t-shirts or buttons and stickers, or mainly uh, the thing that I'm concerned with or interested in uh, are, are fine art prints, paintings, drawings, things like that, uh, even tattoo flash. And so uh, I wanted to sit down with Jason because he has a lot of experience in uh, in printing. He does a lot of printing for Reinventing the Tattoo. In fact, if you don't know Jason, he leads a, a drawing show on Reinventing the Tattoo. I believe it's on Sundays. Uh, I'll leave that information in the in the description below so you can uh, go sit and draw live with Jason on, uh, on Sundays, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but anyways, I, I sat down with Jason because he uh, he knows a lot about printing for all the way from printing on, you know, laser printers or, or you know, printers at, at home to hiring uh, print services, uh, light fastness, uh, the difference in, in in qualities of pigments and papers and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, I thought we would sit down and, and do a, a little episode and just run through a lot of that information for people like myself who really never uh, dove too deeply into into fine art printing. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Uh, I got a lot out of it. I'll leave links to anything that Jason goes over, uh, whether it's types of printers or way to photograph your pr ways to photograph your prints, things like that. I'll leave links uh, to uh, to any of the uh, um, equipment or, or or stuff that he uh, that he suggests or that he highlights. So thanks as always for supporting what we do, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. Well, uh, yeah. so one thing I have been doing, and and this is actually the third uh, podcast that I've recorded in the last couple of weeks. I'm trying to get back into it. And the way that I decided to do that is by trying to uh, focus on things that I'm curious about right now and then find people to, you know, to, to, to answer those questions or to offer their thoughts. And then so the other day on the Tattoo Weekly, which we do every Monday, uh, you were uh, you were in the chat room and we were talking about uh, fine art printing. We were talking about printing anything, stickers, t-shirts, uh, all that kind of stuff. And it's funny, I've been thinking about that a good bit lately. And I'll tell you, I'll try to keep it real short. Uh, but I, I have always, when I go to tattoo conventions, I've always had a booth mate and I've never been one to like bring stuff for my booth, really. I'm, I bring a banner and I give my booth mate a free access to the entire table to put out their t-shirts and their stickers. I might throw a few fireside stickers out. Rarely do I bring a portfolio because if I'm not already booked, I don't go to the show. <laughs> so I'm not trying to sell tattoos while I'm there. So I don't bring a book. Uh, you know, I, sometimes I'll have some fireside stickers. I typically don't want to travel with a bunch of t-shirts and stuff. So uh, I haven't been. I just like my presence is just my banner and me hunched over tattooing the whole time. And so at Hell City Columbus a few weeks ago or months ago now, my booth mate last minute had to, or not last minute, but my booth mate had to, couldn't make it. So I just had the booth to myself. And so I started thinking like, oh, I can't just have an empty booth. I don't want it to look like that. I don't like that look. So I had some sticker packs printed. Uh, I found some old fireside t-shirts and I packed them up in my truck. I, you know, I, I, I got a little iPad holder and I had my portfolio display, you know, uh, on through my iPad. And I started thinking about how I, uh, as time goes on, how tattooing at conventions is breaking down my body. I can't put in these eight or 10 hour days that I tend to put in at conventions. And I thought, you know, if I just focused a little bit more on, on promoting Fireside and on selling the hundreds of paintings that I have sitting around me right now or prints of those paintings, I could probably make, you know, make the same living uh, at conventions, make this, you know, make the same amount of money that I could doing 
tattoos. Uh, maybe, maybe not, but at least I could you know, get close or break even. Or at the very least, a lot of people, if they are tattooing at shows, or maybe they're showing up hoping to do tattoos and waiting on walk-ins, having some type of potential for supplemental income or secondary income is, you know, is obviously a good thing. But when you walk the aisles, there is a wide range of quality when it comes to, you can tell some people are printing their they're photographing their prints and they're on their home printer and they're selling them for $10 a piece. Other people have very high-end limited uh, geek clay prints on some type of cold press, you know, or, you know, or paper, all this and everything in between. Uh, same thing when it comes to t-shirts, when it comes to, you know, hats, stickers, buttons, you just see this wide range. And I thought, you know, I don't know how to, anywhere that I go to print, like if I go to Sticker Mule or if I go to Vista Print, um, there are options for me to make the print as good or as bad as I want it to be, but I don't Absolutely. know. Absolutely, <laughs> I don't know how to interpret most of it. So uh, there's a very big, in my opinion, at least, a very big divide between, oh well, I can do these at home on my own, you know, uh, inkjet printer. Go for it. Have fun. Let me know, you know, what it looks like in five years under direct sunlight. You know, because those those homemade, you know, oh, I, I've got this nice little, you know, compact one. I'll just run off some eight by tens. That's great, but that's not going to last. Um, I've I, I in all honesty, I've done prints like that before way back when. And uh, they look absolutely terrible today, yeah. Ab like ridiculously terrible. Um, I'm actually embarrassed that there are some that are out there. Yeah. Um, Nothing I can really do about that unless I hunt down the people that bought them. But there's a very big difference in quality. Uh, when you look at people like Teresa Sharp, right? Love her work, love her prints. Um, I own several of them. She's got a very high art way to go about it. And I think it's a great idea for people to really get into creating fine art prints, especially because as you're traveling around to a lot of these different shows, say you're at Hell City, say you're at the Puerto Rico Tattoo Convention or you know Paris, uh, the Deadly Show, wherever there's a whole group of very, very high quality artists that you know are probably gonna be priced appropriately. Um, the question then becomes, okay, these people are booked out months in advance. They're a little bit outside my budget as far as getting tattooed by them, but I still wanna collect something from them. You know, I want to have a little piece of them to take home with me. So one of the ways that I've always found is absolutely awesome for that is fine art prints. Um, I used to do enamel pins. Those were great, but I kept losing them. Uh, stickers were great, but they kept breaking down and then I would lose some of them. And then most people would come by and, you know, maybe I'd have like three stickers for a dollar out or something like that. But most people weren't carrying around singles. So it's like, okay, well, just, just take them. It's promo, whatever. Um, you know, so for me, it was like, okay, well, if I go with prints, people can take a work of art home that I did, you know, lim very limited run, very limited production. You know, maybe I'll only do 10 of, you know, a specific image or 20 of a specific image just to keep the availability of them down. That also increases the price because, you know, once they're all sold, they're all sold. Um, maybe I'll do something later on with like a smaller size or on a different surface. But it's just the way that I've found people like to go through and collect artwork from artists that they really admire that they otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to collect. You know, um, certain yeah. artists out there in excess of $5,000 a day. And it's like, okay, well, I love the work that they do, but don't exactly have five grand to throw around all at once. So what can I do? Oh, they've got a $60 print. I'll take that. Awesome. You know, nice size, maybe 13 by 19. or uh, Usually that's the biggest size you see. And, uh, you know, maybe an 11 by 17 or an 11 by 14. But it's like that way I get to take a piece of that artist home with me. And I don't have to spend $5,000, which is awesome. Right. right? Um, so it's, it, to me, it's a more affordable way to share who you are with other people. Um, and, you know, they're fairly cost effective if you find the right printer. If you, I mean, everyone's got their own different types of pricing structures. 
but it's, it's a great way to do it. And it's a great way to display who you are as an artist and what you are capable of. Yeah. Um, so, so, so what about, uh, what about getting into some of the, uh, that's some of the why's you might do it, but what, what about getting into some of the, some of the hows? say someone like me, you know, has, has finished paintings that need to be obviously photographed a certain way. I'm sure that has a huge right. impact on the quality of prints, uh, how to determine, you know, wh whether you, whether it makes sense to invest in a printer that you can make high quality prints or whether you're sending them to a printing service. Uh, how, that pro can you kind of walk through some of the trial and error that you went through or however you want to present it? it how, Where do if, I start with that? Um, I've made more errors than probably a lot of people realize over the years. Um, so the as far as photographing goes, always photograph in a raw setting, uh, no matter what camera you use. And it doesn't matter how big your canvas is. I always suggest, you know, basically holding up a little ruler, taking your camera, getting as close as you can to it so that that ruler, that distance of, you know, 12 inches or so fills the entire screen on the camera. Take a picture and move it over eight inches. That way there's always a little bit of an overlap you create a whole bunch of these very good, very high resolution tiles. Take that into Photoshop, measure out your canvas, measure out your painting. Take that into Photoshop, stitch all of those tiles together next to each other to create a very good high resolution image. Yeah. What this is gonna do is number one, it's gonna allow you to go through and eliminate glare because as you move across the painting and then down a little bit and then move back across and then down a little bit more and then move back across, it eliminates a lot of the issues that you might run into with lighting from a certain specific angle. Um, and lighting a canvas is also something that takes a little bit of trickery, if you will. Um, I always like a very high up, very almost completely straight down light. If you're photographing a work of art, this eliminates a lot of the bounce back glare that you get, a lot of that reflective light. So it eliminates a lot of that. And I always like to take my photographs at like three o'clock in the morning with one single overhead light source, total darkness or otherwise, so that that way, say it's a more expressive painting, right? Uh, something a little bit more impasto, where you have a lot of these thick chunks of you know acrylic or oil painting that are on there that really shows off that brushwork. Well, by having an overhead light source, you're gonna see some of those cast shadows from that brushwork. So that's going to really be able to go through and give an accurate depiction of, you know, what is the texture of that paint like, you know, then that's going to translate once you print it. And it, because of that single overhead light source, it's going to really look like a singular brush stroke on canvas as opposed okay. to, okay, well, this was a flat area and the shape looks a little weird because, well, I had, you know, straight on light source or, took it outside, but there's no real direction to the shadows. So like, you can't really tell it was a paint stroke or that this part comes out slightly from the canvas. Um, it gives it a little bit more depth as far as texture of the paint. Mm. Yeah, that's that's great advice. I've never never considered that. How do you keep it, uh, just, just, just trying to envision doing this, how do you keep the, ensure that the painting, do you have uh, any, any contraption or anything except to ensure that the painting and the camera remain at the exact same angle to each other as you, move and tile it? So on Amazon, there's tons of things. They're, um, they're like little slide rigs you can get for tripods. They mm -hmm. screw right onto a tripod um, and you can get them in different lengths. Obviously, um, they're not that much. I think that they range anywhere from like maybe 80 bucks to 250 bucks for you know some pretty decent sized ones. And what it is, is basically a little crank. So you mount your digital SLR um, which is what I usually use. I don't have a mirrorless camera yet. Um, still debating on different models of uh, Sony, but got some other good ideas from a friend of mine that's a photographer uh, who's also a tattoo artist, but is a huge photography nerd. So I'm saving up to get something a bit nicer as far as mirrorless goes. But you mount that right on the slide rail. And then there's usually a little crank in the back that will allow you to crank it over a certain in increment at a time. Mm -hmm. This way, your camera stays at the same angle. The only thing that's different is that it moves across. Okay. You know, so you're at the same height, 
same angle the whole time. It's just sliding horizontally. Okay. This way you maintain your level, you maintain your angle. Everything is exactly the same except for sliding that camera over a little bit. Okay, so the painting is remaining stationary and you're sliding exactly. the camera on the tripod. Yep, gotcha. I mean, you can try to slide the painting over, but when you're working with larger paintings, that's not really an option. Hmm. Um, you know, trying to slide over a six foot by three foot canvas is not exactly an easy task to keep everything exactly the same. Hmm. So I always prefer to move myself as opposed to the actual work of art. Not just that, but the more you handle original artwork, the higher the chance there is of damaging it, you know, whether it's, you know, taking it off the wall and moving it over, and then maybe something gets knocked into it or something and chips the paint. Well, now you're liable for that. Mm -hmm. So I try to eliminate any and all liability as far as, am I going to damage this? Because I, I don't want to have to pay for someone's original painting because I damaged it when trying to photograph it for a print. Right. Um, so it, it, let's say you had, let's use a three foot by six foot canvas. How, uh, how many tiles typically would you, how many photographs would it take for you to, to, um, to photograph with maybe a three by six? How, how small would you break that down? Would the camera be eight inches probably, away from? I would probably break that down into something that's maybe, and, and I'm kind of weird when it comes down to photographing huge canvases like that. Um, I actually take a little piece of string and I'll tape it horizontally straight across. This way I know where my bottom edge is. And then this way I can always make sure I have a little bit of overlap. So I'll take that and then I'll take, you know, a couple of pieces of string from the top, tape them to a penny so that I can weight them. This way I know everything's perfectly, you know, perfectly in line and across. And, um, you know, I'll go through and I usually space it out at about eight inches by, I think it usually ends up being something like eight inches wide by maybe six inches deep, you know, so, okay. you know, there, there's a couple of tiles there, maybe five or six, um, you know, just in case I want to get a couple of those in between ones, there's a little bit more texture in a certain spot. I'll make sure I do a good straight on photo of just that one area. This way I know I have that accurate. Um, otherwise, you know, if it's something a little bit more flat, maybe a, maybe it's a two foot by three foot watercolor painting, right? Where I'm not really worried about getting those real specific like paint dabs and texture because I know everything's pretty much flat. Um, I'll usually take a little bit more of a zoomed out approach because I know it's still going to be extremely high resolution when I stitch it all together. For things like that, I'll usually do somewhere around 12 inches, maybe 14, depending. Um, but And then that way I always have an overlap and I always have that tiling going so that it's at a consistent level. Hmm. Um, and I can keep maintaining that consistency and I know, okay, this shot and then this part of this one overlaps with that part of that one. This part of this one overlaps with that part of that one. This whole row overlaps with this part of this row. So it makes it a lot easier to piece things together. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, so so you've 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 photographed these tiles, you've stitched them together in Photoshop. I assume the recommendation for someone like me who doesn't have a, a fine art printer, doesn't know a lot about color correction is to find a good printer and have it printed professionally? <laughs> is that the, is I mean, that? That's, well, in Photoshop, what you would wanna do is make sure that whatever image you're working with has at least a bare minimum working resolution of 300 DPI, mm -hmm. bare minimum. Anything less than that, you may run into issues with clarity. Um, I, whenever I am printing things for people like that, I usually print at 600. So I'll get done, you know, stitching everything together measure everything out, make sure it's the actual size, make sure that the resolution is right around 600 DPI, maybe a little less depending on how big of a, uh, an image it actually is. But I wanna keep it as close to actual physical, physical size as possible. Um, when I go to print, 600 DPI usually does the trick for me. And with the printer that I have, I can get you know insane photographic detail quality I think mine does something something insane like 
1600 DPI mm. for my printer. Wow. And to create a 1600 DPI image in Photoshop, the final size is going to be astronomical. Mm. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, it's just going to be too big to work with uh, unless you have, you know, a, you know, a dedicated photo imaging computer that's completely spec'd out. Um, I do not. I work off of a laptop, which works great for mobile capabilities. But yeah, if I was going to work at that kind of a resolution, oh, it, it, I would need something dedicated for it. Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm not into a lot of mass production. I do. I have a very small clientele, um, and I tell them right off the bat, like I'm not into mass production. If you want a thousand prints of something. I'll give you some recommendations of who to talk to. If you want, you know, 400 prints of something, I will be more than happy to tell you who to reach out to. If you're looking for, you know, maybe 50 of each of these four images, great, I can do that. Not a problem. Let's talk about surface. Let's talk about, and I'll sit down and I'll, it's almost like a tattoo consultation. I'll go through and I'll talk to them about different surfaces. I'll bring examples. You know, do you want it on canvas? Which if you're painting on canvas, you're usually gonna wanna print on something pretty similar to it just for that natural canvas texture. This way you take an image of in, say an oil painting or an acrylic painting, you can reproduce it and have it be on a very similar surface to what you painted on. So people actually think that they're holding on to that work of art. Mm. Yeah, no. that's a, that's a good point. Let, um, let, let me. I want to. I want to keep going down that uh, down that avenue, but I want to take a, a quick little detour. So many people are drawing and uh, uh, doing their actual artwork in Procreate these days, and a lot of people are doing high end digital artwork now. In Photoshop, you can create a high resolution digital painting and probably make high end digital prints. Is anyone making high end digital prints from Procreate, or is that not possible? Most of my clients are they. Okay, what's yeah. what's that process? Um, so, uh, and this is, I'm very specific with when I talk to them, when someone reaches out to me saying, hey, I want you to do some prints for me. It's like, okay, let's start the dialogue, right? Working in, is it digital? Is it physical? You know, what, because that's going to take us down two different avenues. If they're working digital and they are working in Procreate, I will let them know ahead of time, I'm not sure how big your image is, what your canvas setup is like, but here's what my general requirements and general recommendations are for creating something for digital print in Procreate. You wanna make sure that your canvas is at least 300 DPI, at least 600 if you can, but that's also gonna limit the number of layers that you have. Um, Try to think about how big you want these prints to be. If you want to do a 13 by 19 print, which in my opinion looks pretty nice, um, but that's also with like a one inch border around each side. So it's usually a bit smaller, like 11 by 17. So say they wanted a 13 by 19 print with a one inch border around each side. They're going to create an 11 by 17 canvas at 300 DPI. Create your artwork on that. If you're working on the standard screen size of an iPad, um, and I actually wrote this down earlier, at 300 DPI, it's only nine inches by 9.1 inches by 6.8 inches. Mm. But when you click on screen size in Procreate, the resolution is far lower than 300 DPI. It's, you, it's set up by default at 132. That means if you take something and you're drawing on the standard screen size for an iPad and you try to blow it up, those lines, those areas are going to get distorted. You're going to have a little bit of pixelation. That's not going to translate well into a digital fine art print. Hmm. Now, okay. people like me that you know are kind of suckers for friends, we'll go through. We have ways to clean that up a little bit, but... I try to stay away from that because I feel like that's actually altering that person's artwork. And I try not to do that. Um, mm. You know, if you come to me with an image prepped and ready to go, it meets all my specs. It's like, yeah, I'll throw it in the printer right now. Mm. How many do you want? 
cool, let's do it, you know, and I'll get started on it. Yeah. Um, but it's when you have to sit down and you have to make things fit certain sizes and blow things up or shrink things down to get things to fit right. That's where you get a lot of pixelation and, and a lot of distortion. So if you're going to create anything for a fine art print, say you want to keep it small, right? You want to keep the physical size small, but you know you're going to want to blow it up. But you still want everything to be crystal clear. Make the resolution even higher. Make the resolution 600 DPI, right? But make your canvas size, say, six and a half by nine and a half, right? Okay. So that way you can cut that resolution in half, blow it up to double the size, and you're still using the same number of pixels. You're not going to have any distortion. It's going to be perfectly clear. The only thing that you're doing is changing the way that the computer sees those pixels. Mm. But it's the same exact number. So you're not going to have any distortion. Um, it, it's one like little trick that I found that works really well when working in Procreate. Uh, as far as exporting that file, say you go through, you're creating an 11 by 17 canvas at 300 DPI. Awesome. Great. Um, and you want, you're done with it and you want to send it to me for print. Awesome. There's a whole bunch of different formats. Procreate asks you what you want to export in. And certain things are better than others. Um, you know, you've got the Procreate format. That's usually best for like collaborative artwork because it maintains all the different layers. You can go through, you can edit each individual layer, keeps everything the same way. You're not going to have any kind of distortion. Um, and ev I even ask people like, listen, if you did this in Procreate, send me the Procreate file too. Throw that on my iPad. If I absolutely have to, I'll export that in a different format or I'll you know make it whatever alterations or if you find an error in it. Um, and that happens every now and then someone will notice a little smudge or a dot and they're like, oh, dude, I hate to do this to you, but I noticed like a little smudge in this file or like a little dot or maybe one of the layers shifted. And I'm like, okay, tell me what layer, I'll adjust it, re-export it since I already have that file. Mm -hmm. And I can do that. It's going to take a lot less time than having you go through, do that, re-export it, re-upload it, email me the link to it. I'm going to download it take all that out. Um, just tell me what to edit. I'll make that alteration and you'll be good. Yeah. Uh, PSD is the best for if you're sending it to someone like me. This way, it's still in layer form, but it's compatible with my printer and it's compatible with my computer. I can go through, translate that into a digital print in minutes. Hmm. Uh, PDF's good if you want to prevent anyone else from editing it kind of flattens the image, uh, but it is great for universal compatibility, okay? It's, you can read a PDF on just about any device ever created. Um, Adobe, who creates Photoshop and Illustrator, created the PDF format uh, many, many years ago for that specific reason. Hmm. JPEGs are nice. Uh, it's small file size. You can view them on almost everything, but it compresses the image and it flattens all the layers. So if you have a background in there, um, it's going to make the entire image completely flat. Mm -hmm. There's no layers. There's no editing. It's great for a smaller file size, and it's great for images that say you want to have a white background to it or a black background. Cool. Send a JPEG. That'll work. Um, but if you, you want to keep a transparent background, use the next format down. Use a PNG file. Uh, PNGs are great for maintaining transparency. So if you're creating a sticker or a business card, right? And you know you wanna have certain areas that are transparent. Say you want white card stock to show through or say you're super fancy and you get some of those new metallic ones made, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can actually have certain metallic areas show through to show what that color of the card is. Um, so, I mean, those are great. They're a little bit bigger of a file size, but they're great for maintaining transparency. If you don't mind compressing everything, send a TIFF. Uh, TIFF is true image file format. And that is the best for pre preserving your clarity. Hmm. Um, it will merge the layers, but that's okay because you're going to be getting a very uncompressed, very large singular image. 
that's going to have all of the information at a very high quality. Um, you know, send, you know, if people were sending me an image, send me Procreate PSD or TIFF. Um, okay. You can, those are usually the recommended options. Uh, Procreate just so that I can make any alterations if you need them. PSD just for ease of use because I can get that to print a lot faster. TIFF is great because it maintains all the clarity. Um, so one of those three usually works the best. That's that's interesting. You know, TIFF is one of those that I never explored. I like look right past it as an export. I see it as a as a uh, an option to export on almost everything that I use. And I've never I like look past it like it's not even there. I didn't even know what it was until you just said yeah. that. It, I had no idea if it was a higher resolution, a higher quality than a JPEG, or yeah, even you know what would even read it or. It is the downside to TIFF format is that the file sizes can be pretty huge. Okay. Uh, because it's not compressing anything. It's very raw, very, this is the way that it is. Okay. Um, okay. Which and, is and great if you have more expressive work too, because it maintains all those little subtle brush strokes. Yeah. 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 And for people who don't really get the, uh, uh, what, what it means to compress an image. Uh, you know, I, I understood it in theory, but out of digital art and back to photographing traditional art, uh, I use a Sony mirrorless camera and I had my setting, I guess, probably by default for a while to every time I took a photo, it recorded a raw file and a JPEG, just I had two of each. And if you've ever, if, if you want to get an idea of what it means to, uh, what the differences are, what compressed versus uncompressed files look like, pull both of those, the same photo, the JPEG and the RAW into a Lightroom, which is what I've used to, and it is absolutely astounding the level of control that you have, the ability to pull what you would think are completely lost areas in the shadow in a RAW file. Like you can take, pull so much detail out of shadows or grab detail from light areas, uh, and as opposed to the JPEG where there's the, the, the slide, you know, you're using the same sliders, you're using all the same adjustment tools. It just, it's the matter of, you know, it's the difference in being able to adjust it this far or this far, you know, you can pull right. so much more out. Uh, it, I didn't really realize it. Like I said, I, I understood it in theory, but until I actually took the exact same photo and edited the JPEG and the raw, I realized like, oh, I don't have any use for these JPEGs. They don't do it. Like there's no yeah. reason in the world for me to take one. Yeah. It, it, all JPEGs do is it's great for universal compatibility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can pull a JPEG up on your phone, you can pull it up on the web. Um, you, you can pull up just about a JPEG on just about anything, just about anywhere at any time, which yeah. is great. If that's what you're going for, awesome. Um, if you don't need transparency in it, great. Most websites that are out there will have JPEGs uploaded on images that don't have any kind of transparency um, because they are universally compatible. It's a small file size and they don't need to edit it because it's already been edited. But if you really want the best image for anything as far as, um, you know, maybe slight tonal adjustments or hue or gradient adjustments, go with a TIFF. You can't go wrong. It's gonna get rid of a lot of the layers. You're not gonna have any layers left that image is going to be super sharp. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's, uh, let, let's move on and maybe back to traditional uh, art being photographed. If someone, maybe let's look at two different uh, avenues of it. If someone wanted to invest the time, effort, money into uh, thinking maybe they're going to make a lot of digital prints and they want to look at fine art printers, can you run through any, uh, any of the, um, like qualities that you looked for that helped you to choose one printer over another. And if you don't mind, maybe sharing what printer you ended up going with. And then maybe we'll talk about services like yours. We'll see where people can reach out to you if they want to have uh, yeah. you make the prints for them. So uh, in my opinion, it's not always necessarily about the printer itself. It's about the type of pigment that the printer uses, or okay. let me rephrase. It's about the type of ink that the printer uses. Um, did a lot of homework and a lot of research on a lot of different types of printers, different companies, what their standard is. Um, I always look for a printer that uses pigment ink. Uh, pigment ink is archival. It is good for hundreds of years without fading, without any kind of alteration. Any type of 
museum quality photograph or museum quality reproduction that you see, it's going to be made with pigment ink. Um, there are a lot of companies out there that still use a dye-based ink. Those are not typically light fast. They have a tendency to bleed far more, which means you don't really have that much control over where the edge of that color is when it's being printed. Um, for precision and accuracy, always go with a pigment-based ink. The best one that I found that was right in my price range uh, was a nice fine art printer from Ebsen. Uh, it's the, I think it's a little bit of an older model, but it's the Sure Color P800. And it uses an eight or no, sorry, a nine color ink cartridge system. So I've got photo black, matte black, light black, light, light black, magenta, light magenta, cyan, light cyan, yellow and i think there was one no and yellow um okay. are the last ones some of the higher end printers that you can get out there will have an orange cartridge some of them will have a light yellow cartridge um, the more colors that you have the more control over the color reproduction goes mm -hmm. the one i the printer i usually use for most of my production stuff it's not very big it's, you know, uh, maybe 24 inches wide. I can print up to 17 inch wide rolls. It's perfect for, you know, if you want to run off your own prints. Um, you know, it's very cost effective. You can usually find them used on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, if you want to go with prints that are a bit wider than 17 inches, and keep in mind, a lot of prints that you see aren't that big they're not wider than 17 inches unless you start getting into like huge reproductions um, or poster printing or anything like that. Most prints that you will come across at any kind of tattoo convention, you're looking at 11 by 14, 11 by 17, 13 by 19, and 8 by 10. Mm -hmm. You're not really looking at too many other sizes. Occasionally well, you'll find someone that's got bigger stuff, but yeah. And if you think about by the time someone mats and, and frames a, a 17 inch wide, you know, print, uh, you know, it's a 23, 24 inch wide, depending on the width of the frame, you know, on the mat, obviously they can make it giant. A lot of people will oversize mats or double mats or to make to yeah. make something seem a lot larger than it actually is. I, I invested, I haven't bought a printer, but I did buy a nice mat cutter. Uh, about a year ago and i and i bought a lot of matte board just a stock of matte board and that's been really really useful i can um because you know i can really go to michael's or jump on one of these cheap frame uh online framing uh, uh shops and just order a common size order eight or ten of them cut my yeah. own mats in different colors it, it takes me no time to do and then put those things together and they look really nice so and that's that's what most framing places will do They'll say, oh, you like this frame? Great. What's your, what? Oh, okay, cool. Here's what we'll do for you. We're going to charge you a whole bunch of money. And then we're just going to cut a mat to fit the size of this frame. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going to custom make a frame for you, but we will make this look great in that frame over there. Right. Only we're going to charge you nine times more. But I, I did the same thing. I have my own mat cutter and that has been an absolute godsend. Um, I have my own mat cutter and my own paper trimmers and all that stuff. Um, I usually, so especially for things that are, that people want borderless images, I personally, and this is just a recommendation if anyone out there decides to start making their own prints, find the next size paper up and then just have your image be border to border or like when you're printing it out, but don't change the size of the paper. So if I'm gonna print a, an edge to edge 11 by 17, I'll grab a piece of 13 by 19 and then just trim off the edges. Okay. The reason being because you want to allow a little bit of bleed room for that pigment as you're printing. So as for, as long as you go through and you measure, and this is where having a good paper cutter and mat cutter comes in handy. As long as you measure the right size at right angles and everything like that, you're going to get a perfect edge to edge print. Mm. If you don't and you try to do edge to edge on 11 by 17 paper, a lot of printers will actually tend to blur out the edges 
sometimes print heads can get stuck and snagged on the sides of thicker cardstock or thicker fine art paper. Um, so my recommendation, always print on a sized paper bigger and then trim it down. Okay. Uh, yeah. It'll save you a lot of time. That makes, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay. So, so uh, to the, back to the printers themselves, a pigment based yeah. uh, printer, uh, pigment based inks is one consideration. Uh, the, yes. the, the size that the printer can actually handle the width of paper that the printer can handle would be another consideration. The number of inks, the number of colors that it can hold is a third consideration. Any yep, absolutely okay. In anything um, else? That's where so and the number of inks that that individual printer will take. That's usually the hidden cost to a fine art print. Hmm. So you might be able to get you know a nice Epson fine art printer that can do a seventeen inch wide roll, and it might only be a thousand bucks. But when you start to add up the cost of $60 a cartridge for, you know, eight or nine cartridges, mm. you start to turn around and ask yourself, was this really a good investment? Mm -hmm. you know? So in that respect, and, it's a lot like a regular printer, like any printer that you buy for office use. They, they'll they'll yeah. basically give you the printer because they know you're going to buy ink every, you know, month and a half. Bingo. Right. Yeah. You know, I always recommend sticking with the actual specific brand of cartridges that the printer comes with simply because and i ran into this issue with a previous printer if you buy off brand cartridges that are very similar and that will work that's great but you do not know what kind of ink is in that print cartridge mm -hmm. you don't know if it's dye based or pigment based mm -hmm. be, be cautious about that if you throw pigment based ink through a dye based printer you might as well throw the printer out. Oh. You will clog every single print head. You will have to replace a lot of that. All the print nozzles are going to get clogged um, because it's a lot more viscous. It's a lot thicker. And it's not, it, it's going to come out in a completely different way and you can completely destroy things. So be very careful with that. Okay. Um, yeah. So just as a word, you can always get high capacity cartridges. Those are going to run you more, usually $120 a piece. Uh, but once again, now you're doubling the cost of the printer, right? Because right. you have to have ink for each one of those. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, you can usually get several hundred prints out of, you know, an individual cartridge. Hmm. And depending on what you're printing, what primary colors are being used. Um, I just ran a, a series of prints for uh, Harlan Kantner out, in, uh, out at Athens Tattoo Company in Maryland. Um, there were a lot of areas of heavy black in it. So my matte black went from completely full to like a quarter left oh. in one run of prints. Hmm. So it's like, okay, if there's a lot of black in an image, you're gonna move through that. You have to kind of anticipate that. Um, you know, so just keep that in mind as you're printing, but you can generally get quite a few prints out of every cartridge. Okay. So as far as cost effectiveness, it does pan out in the long run. Do, do you try to keep a stock of different um, printing, uh, different papers, canvases, surfaces to print on? Do you keep a wide variety? Always. I, I, have, I have some of my own personal favorite papers always in stock. Um, you can never go wrong, in my opinion, and with a lot of people that work in Procreate that want that very fine art feel, but they know that their image is going to look very digital. I always recommend going with a very rough paper surface, um, a very heavily textured paper surface. Makes it look like it's more like um, a liquid acrylic painting or watercolor painting. And I always keep those in stock and on hand. Uh, I'm, I, I just love the feel of it and how it feels like an actual painting. Mm. But that's also because I work with liquid acrylic and watercolor quite frequently. So right, if I was... Right doing a lot more acrylic paintings. I'd probably keep rolls of canvas in stock, um, which I don't really have too many requests for, believe it or not. There's not too many people that want canvas prints. That's fine. Um, I like to collect them on different surfaces, but once again, depending on what you're trying to reproduce, that's something that you may want to go with, you know, to give it that authentic work of art feel. Mm. Um, so just some food for thought, but I always keep yeah. tons of different stuff in stock and on hand from budget friendly papers to, um, you know, super high end, you know, 
310 GSM uh, heavyweight, like actual arches, watercolor paper. Uh, okay. You know, there's, I even know a couple of people in the, in the printmaking business that have ways of going through and taking actual arches, 140 pound cold press, no print right on top of it. Oh. Uh, they've got a whole special process that's involved with hand coating, hand trimming. It's, it's a whole handmade process. But what you get is an actual reproduction of that painting on the surface that it was painted on. Mm, yeah. You know, so, and it gives it a completely unique feel. Um, but they're also, you know, the time that it takes to do that makes getting prints like that far more expensive. Sure. Yeah. Well, but before we wrap it up, one thing that we kind of glazed over that I, I that I thought about afterwards uh, that we might want to, you might want to touch on is you mentioned how you light the painting, lighting it directly from above late at night with no surrounding light. Uh, obviously the, the, the temperature of the light, what light, what you're lighting it with has some bearing. Do you have any advice on, on, on what, what lights to use and what environments or. So I always go with something as close to daylight as humanly possible. Um, 56 K is you know, usually a pretty decent range. Uh, you can go around 48 if you want, but, um, you know, color temperature can really change the way that uh, a painting appears because as we all know, the temperature of the light coming off of the surface is gonna be captured by the camera. So if you say you've got a warmer painting and you really want those warm tones to come out, maybe throw a warm light on it. I don't typically try to do that just because I don't want to skew the actual pigment tones. Um, but yeah, as close as to natural daylight as you possibly can get. Um, try to stay away from anything like a soft white or a, if you're using incandescent bulbs, stay away from like soft white or a cool white uh, kind of bulb. If you're using anything like an LED or a fluorescent, um, you can get away with just about anything as long as it's, you know, as close to natural light as you can get. Okay. Yeah. And, and then finally, if people uh, want to see your work, whether it's your tattoo work, fine art work or printing work, where's the best place to send them? Um, you can always go and check out my stuff on Instagram at Philly Inc. Uh, P H I L L Y I N K. Uh, and I do a lot of communication through there, answer questions, uh, set up tattoo appointments. I don't really have like a tattoo booking system. It's usually just email or DM, but, uh, or for VIPs, they can just text me, but that's a different story. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, hit me up on Instagram. What about if, if they're interested in, uh, in, in print, same thing? Same Instagram thing, list? hit me up, okay. make that initial contact. We can go through, we can start the dialogue and the conversation, uh, figure out some specifics. I'll see if it's in the realm of what I'm capable of doing uh, in a timely manner, because I don't want you to have to be waiting around for six months to get some prints. That's just not, Yeah. I, I'm probably gonna forget about it in six months. I'm not sure. gonna lie. Yeah. Uh, so it's what I can do in a timely manner. If I'm flooded with jobs at that time, might take a little while, but I will put you on the list and I will get to it. Um, you know, I don't usually try to take on too many clients, but there's, I will always make room for more people. Sweet. So. Well, cool, man. Well, I appreciate you taking the time and sharing all this. It's really, it really was helpful, helpful, helpful for me, uh, for sure, because I think that's something I may uh, transition towards is trying to, to, especially at conventions, trying to back off of tattooing a little bit and, and maybe try to, to offer a few more, um, uh, whether it's originals or, 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 or fine art prints just to, and for, for everyone watching, just if, if it's nothing you've considered before, I think just having a, uh, an additional potential source of revenue at shows, particularly if you're not someone who books in advance, if you just go and you're sitting and hoping you're going to tattoo and cover that booth and hotel expense, uh, you know, it surely doesn't hurt to have, you know, some $50 prints sitting out there or, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever price range to your point, you can make them as cheap as you want or as high end as you want. I would be interested. I know you got to go, but I would be interested to learn, uh, all things the same, uh, you know, it, how many people buy 10 and $20 prints versus how many people buy, you know, a uh, hundred dollar limited prints at, at a show. I've never, I've never done a side-by-side -side 
kind of comparison, you know, uh, I don't know what, I don't know which would sell better. So, I mean, that's why I try to offer personally, like a variety of different stuff. You know, I've got like little eight by 10 guys. Um, and these are my own, but I, I offer eight by tens and 13 by 19s, uh, 13 by 19s. I usually tend to price around 40, $50. Uh, the eight by tens are usually around 20 bucks, but I try to do sets and additions. Mm. So I'll have, you know, five or six images up that are all eight by tens, you know, buy the whole set and I'll knock off 20 bucks, mm. you know, you know, buy five, get the sixth for free or whatever. Right. Um, for you know some of the larger prints, those are signed, numbered, and editioned. Um, and that's one thing. If I can, if anyone out there is listening to me now and you start making fine art prints, please sign and edition them correctly. Um, it's like one of the biggest pet peeves I have out there is like people that all they do is put their signature at the bottom and call it a day. And it's like addition it, give it value. You know, mm -hmm. if I wanted to turn around and archive this and pull it out later and get it appreciated or get it appraised in value, they're gonna wanna ask, okay, what number is this out of how many, mm -hmm. you know? So sign it, title it and addition it and yeah. keep that going. Uh, a lot of people that have a fine art background that do prints, they're all signed, numbered and editioned. Uh, maybe it's your first edition or second edition or third edition, that's fine. It doesn't matter how many editions you do but sign and number each edition. Uh, it's once again, it's just a little pet peeve of mine, but that's good advice. It takes two minutes to Google it, how to do it right. Mm -hmm. Look it up. Trust me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very simple, very easy to do. I find that a lot of more serious art collectors will pick up bigger prints. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people that really want to take a piece home, you know, a piece of you home with them that, and maybe you don't have, original paintings for sale, maybe you only show up, but you've got, you know, 18 different prints, you know, that people can buy from super huge two foot by four foot to, you know, small little six by eight. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to see that a lot of people go for the smaller ones because they're going to be more budget friendly. You know, I try to keep mine in multiples of $20 just because most people have a 20 on them. But if you put $25, now you have to stop what you're doing, get change, you know, break a 20. And now you're like, okay, well, I don't have any change on me. So now I'm just going to discount it five bucks from what the original price was until I can get some change. Yeah. Just do away with all that. If you're going to do I, a, a four by five or a six by eight, sell it for 10 bucks, 15 bucks, whatever. Well, 10 bucks, um, yeah. sell an eight by 10 for 20, do it in twenties. Mm -hmm. I made that mistake with sticker packs, uh, doing my first sticker packs. I did them at $3. And I was like, why did I say $3? Of course, everyone just left a five and was like, don't worry about it because I'm tattooing, you know, they're like, yeah. so, so I ended up getting $5 over and over for my $3 uh, sticker pack. So now that should teach me just price them at $5. People are willing yeah. to pay it. Yeah. yeah. Try to think about what kind of, what amounts of money people are going to have on them. Right. You know, if you're at a convention, yeah, $5, $10, $20. Mm -hmm. Try to keep things in those types of increments. And then this way, no one ever has to worry about change, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and then all you're doing is collecting money and you don't have to divvy any out. Yeah. So, yeah. One thing that I did, and then, and then we'll wrap it up. One thing that I did uh, on the second day at Hell City, because I was there alone and I was tattooing the whole time. So I wasn't able to give change or grab things or whatever. I just printed my Venmo and cash app QRs and put them on the table and, and, and if they didn't have cash to say, just Venmo me three bucks, you know? And so a lot of people did that as well. So. Yeah. Which is a great way to do it. Um, I'm a big fan of QR codes. I always have one up at whatever booth I'm working at, you know, usually next to prints, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if prints are sold out, hit me up on Instagram and it's a big Instagram QR code. Mm -hmm. um, Venmo. I have another one there for people that, Oh, well, you know, I, I, I really want one of these, but, um, you know, I don't have any cash on me. Cool. Venmo is right over there in the corner. Go ahead, mm -hmm. send it to me and you can take one. Yeah. Um, you know, and most people out there are pretty good with it. I always recommend if you will be selling anything at the booth, try to have someone there that's working the booth with you. Absolutely. Um, I ran into issues many years ago where I would have a whole series of prints out and inevitably I would end up I, you know, I would sell maybe two of them, 
Um, and I would end up missing like eight of them because people would come by, you know, and they'd be looking at different things and you wouldn't even notice because you're busy in the middle of the tattoo, you know? Uh, so try to have someone to keep an eye on your stuff. Uh, unfortunately, in certain places in the world, people are not always that honest. It stinks, but, you know, there's not really too much we can do about it. Yeah. So, yeah. Good for thought. Right. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. Thanks again. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share all of that. And uh, hopefully uh, we can uh, maybe drop in some of the things you were talking about, particularly like the the slider for the camera or, or any specifics on printers. Maybe we can overlay some of that stuff and, and maybe link to some of it in the video description so that people Absolutely. can access it easily. So awesome, man. Well, now you have to go tattoo. I'm sure we'll catch up again soon. Good yeah, to see you. Yeah, sounds great, man. Anytime. Yeah. Hey, thanks again for watching. I hope you got something out of that. I know that I did. Uh, be sure to keep up with Jason at uh, the links below at his Instagram and at Reinventing the Tattoo. Uh, also, if you haven't already, sign up for our newsletter. Keep up with what Fireside is up to, where we're going, what we're doing, who we're podcasting with. Uh, we have a lot of special trips coming up in 2023, so you'll want to stay up to date on those. Make sure to uh, make sure to sign up. We won't spam you. We'll just send you important stuff or stuff that I think is important. Have a good one. Thanks.